Hello. I want to begin by extending a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us for the first event in a three-part webinar series on faith-based approaches to environmental peace building. As we gather from around the world, I want to first acknowledge that we are gathering, even if virtually, on the traditional homelands of Native peoples, including the Haudenosaunee, Miami, Peoria, and particularly the Pokagon Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and continue to do so. These events are a part of the Road to Geneva series, which is an initiative of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association, and they are co-sponsored by the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion at the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame, as well as the advocacy group Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. On behalf of all of us, we are thankful that you have joined us here today. Major themes in this series on faith-based environmental peace building include interfaith dialogue, decolonization, and futurism. Today, we will be discussing care for creation as a common denominator, interfaith approaches to environmental peace building. We look forward to hearing from a distinguished panel of environmental advocates from a diversity of faith traditions. We also acknowledge that there are many other voices and traditions that we have yet to hear and hope to learn from in the future. I had many motivations for bringing together these topics under one roof for discussion, from experiences ranging from research to activism, but perhaps I will share one small personal story. When I was living at Tantor Ecumenical Institute on the outskirts of Jerusalem, very close to Bethlehem, I took up the composting responsibilities of the Institute. Each evening, occasionally as the call to prayer rang out from down the hill and across the separation wall, I would carry out a small bucket of waste and return it to the land that was deeply meaningful to people of many faith traditions. The short walk became a spiritual practice for me as I wondered at the natural world, be it the slight shift in the moon's phase each night or the invisible microbial ecosystem that would eventually break down the load that I carried. It also became a time to reflect on the visibility of conflict and oppression as I carried out my composting freely on lands that were walled off from many Palestinian families who had previously cultivated them for generations. This experience, though simple and small, became a reminder of the many connections between the environment, peace, or lack thereof, and spirituality. I hope that we will continue to explore these themes and others throughout the series, beginning today by making space for interfaith approaches to the environment. Our moderator for today's panel is Dr. Mahan Mirza, admired Notre Dame professor and executive director of the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion. Welcome Dr. Mirza and thank you for moderating today's panel. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you so much for all of your hard work uh, in putting this together. Uh, this is a very important series. I'm really excited to be a part of it and look forward to uh, the conversation we will have over the next hour. So we have a terrific group of panelists with us today, faith actors and leaders who are engaged in environmental action around the world. Huda Alkaf, founder and director of Wisconsin Green Muslims. She's calling in from Wisconsin and we will have just her audio with us today. Elena Sadijo, Program Executive for Climate Justice in the Lutheran World Federation, and she is joining us all the way from Geneva. Rabbi Jonathan Neril, Founder and Director, the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development, is with us from Jerusalem. And Gopal Patel, director of Bhumi Global, and he is joining us from where he's based in New Jersey. Welcome to all of you. So let's begin. And yeah, I invite you to join us with your video feed if you can, and if you're dialing in to be ready, we're going to get started. And I'd like you to you know, start each of you in the order that I said your name, which is alphabetical. Take a couple of minutes to introduce yourselves in more detail. Tell us about your organization and the kind of work that you do around faith and the environment. Let's begin with Huda. 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I start Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of God, the most gracious, most merciful. I greet you with the Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you all. So I'm an ecologist and an environmental educator. And I started uh, Wisconsin Green Muslims, uh, which is a statewide grassroots environmental justice group formed in 2005, connecting faith, environmental justice, sustainability, and healing through education and service. It intends to educate the Muslim community and the general public about the Islamic environmental justice teachings, to apply these teachings in daily life and to form coalitions and collaborations uh, with others working toward a just, healthy, peaceful, and sustainable future. Our work is guided and inspired by the sacred teachings uh, from the Quran, the Holy Book for Muslims, and the Hadith reports on the sayings and traditions of Prophet Muhammad, God's peace and blessings be upon him. For 16 years now, uh, Wisconsin Green Muslims works on environmental justice issues as it relates to climate change, clean air and pure water, healthy food, solar energy and energy efficiency, waste reduction and transportation equity. Thanks. Thank you, Hoda. Uh, Elena. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sam, for inviting me to be part of this discussion today. So I am currently working as a LWF Executive Program for Climate Justice in the Action for Justice Unit in Geneva. Um, and I previously, I was for six years the LWF regional representative in Central America, based in El Salvador, and working with uh, countries like Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, giving support to Cuba and Costa Rica, countries that suffer a severe drought on one side and extreme weather events on the other. I would like to tell you a little more about the Lutheran World Federation. We are a global community of 148 Lutheran churches in 99 countries with local roots and, and global present. Uh, when we talk about fight and environment, we affirm the need to take urgent action to address the climate crisis. Um, we are committed to strengthening our effort for climate justice, advocating for common but differentiated climate action at all levels, uh, from individual behavior changes to high level political decision making processes. As the community of churches and where engagement is rooted in the spiritual and theological perspective of the Lutheran tradition. And our faith motivates us to cultivate an ecological sense of being human and a vocation to care for well being of all creation. So, um, in the Action for Justice Unit, we accompany our member churches to a certain uh, their advocacy for climate action. Uh, provide, we provide capacity develop, development programs facilitating networking among them and also with relevant stakeholders. Uh, and we engage with churches in projects that either contribute to climate change mitigation, adaptation, or addressing losses and damages. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. All right, from Wisconsin to Geneva and now to Jerusalem, Rabbi Yonatan. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. I founded and direct the Interspaith Center for Sustainable Development. We're revealing the connection between religion and ecology and motivating people to act. We recently published a book called Eco Bible, which is uh, an ecological commentary on the Hebrew Bible in two volumes, looking at about 450 verses and the ecological relevance for our times. We also have a Los Angeles Faith and Ecology Network that works with Muslims, Christians, and Jews in the Los Angeles area. And we have a faith-inspired renewable energy project which deploys solar fields on at a commercial scale on church lands in Africa. Great to be here with you. Good to have you with us, Rabbi Yonatan. And now back to New Jersey, Gopal. Thank you, Mahan, and thank you to the organizers. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you. So I am the co-founder and the director of an organization called Bumi Global. Bumi is a Sanskrit word, which means Mother Earth. 
And this um, organization is a continuation of a previous effort that was called Bumi Project, which was running for over 10 years, working with Hindus globally on issues of climate change and biodiversity. And what we do is we draw out from Hindu texts and traditions, uh, principles and teachings that can be applied to contemporary environmental concerns. Our work primarily consists of training, education and advocacy. A lot of our work is also in a multi-faith context across the United States, United Kingdom, and also across India. And we're also involved at the United Nations. We co-chair the United Nations Multi-Faith Advisory Council and help convene faith coalitions to advocate for biodiversity and climate change at the UN as well. So again, it's a real pleasure to be with all of you. Good to have you, Gopal. Um, this is a wonderfully diverse and rich uh, panel from the Islamic faith, uh, the Hindu tradition, Lutheran uh, tradition, and the Jewish traditions. And so what I'd like to ask now, all of you mentioned, you draw on, you know, scripture, there's the Eco Bible. And so what are some of the key conceptual terms and vocabularies that your faith tradition uses around the environment? Help us understand specifically your teachings as rooted in your tradition. So I'll start with Huda again. Okay, so yeah, a, a key concept in Islam is the is balance and it's repeated, Nizan. It's repeated over and over in the Quran many times. Um, and then there is also um, um, hope. Hope is also a key there, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is reported to have said, if doomsday is about to take place while any one of us has a tree sapling in our hand, which we can cultivate, then cultivate it for you will be rewarded. So this is an active hope message that inspires me. And we see it over and over um, in, the, in the teachings. Yeah. Okay, balance and, and hope. How about um, Elena in, in the Lutheran faith? Well, I, we also uh, consider balance and hope, but um, I would like to, to say that um, the expression that we have been used uh, in our work is climate justice as an umbrella for the whole approach of um, action about climate change. So and we conceive climate justice as a multidimensional concept. So as a matter of economic justice, as a matter of gender justice, and as a matter of intergenerational justice. So we, we also, we also uh, use this, this term no? of, 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 uh, of justice no? because we are um, facing all these uh, problems because of the of the climate change impacts. All right, and I can see, you know, already synergy between the idea of balance and the idea of justice. Uh, Rabbi Yonatan. So in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Genesis, chapter two, verse 15, it's written, and God placed the human being in the garden of Eden to serve it and conserve it. So, we're given a mandate by the creator to live in balance on this planet. We are stewards of creation. We're meant to take care of it. And that theme is very deep to uh, my tradition. And there are hundreds of verses that, that relate to this uh, on the sabbatical year, on taking a Sabbath once every seven days, on not destroying uh, anything of value to people, conserving water. There, there's uh, we could have a many day, many month conversation about this. Thank you. Um, Gopal? Yeah, thanks, Mahan. Um, one of the foundational teachings in Hinduism that lends itself to uh, environmental care is this concept of Dharma, which um, is a Sanskrit word, which, which is translated in various ways. But one of the most common uh, translations is to uphold the balance, uphold good things. And so speaking to what Huda has shared, there's, there's this concept of balance, that the world is in balance. And when the world is out of balance, that is when you see um, 
destruction and, and devastation, such as what we're seeing now when it comes to the environment. So the concept of balance is there coupled with, with harmony, but also uh, a, a concept of responsibility, that we all have a role to play, that the responsibility isn't on other people to do something, but the responsibility is on us to step forward, to be the best versions of ourselves, to contribute to the greater good, to contribute to the balance of, of creation of the manifestation. So those are some of the key um, phrases and concepts that come from the Hindu, Hindu tradition. Thank you. All of you, I can see overlap, but also certain distinctions. And I'd like to develop that a little bit, particularly through the idea of how we conceptualize existence, being, um, some would say it's creation. And that's more what we see in the Abrahamic traditions. Perhaps, you know, it's a manifestation and the idea of co-being in the Dharmic traditions. So I want to ask, and I'll continue with you, Gopal, and then come around. Um, help us understand um, in, the, in, in the tradition that you practice, um, what conceptualizations of nature are there that, are, uh, that help you think about environmental action? Sure. The, I would say the starting point really for Hinduism is that the world is complex and we are very, very small. And in this complex system, we have that responsibility, that dharma, to maintain that balance so the complexity doesn't go out of, out of sync. And so the starting point for Hinduism is, how can I serve? How can I be of service? What is my role? What is my contribution to ensuring things do not go out of balance? Right, that's the starting point. The Sanskrit for that is Ritta, um, it's spelled R-T-A, which is that there's a universal order, there's a universal balance, and my responsibility is to maintain that as well. So what is my service and how do I contribute? I would say that's very much the fundamental starting point. And then from that concept, we get ideas of ahimsa, of nonviolence, of sattva, of living in goodness. So all of these other concepts and these principles come out of this first fundamental teachings of Hinduism, which is that the world is very, very complex um, and we have a responsibility to maintain the balance. And the second um, issue that comes out is the understanding that nature thrives when humanity thrives and vice versa. So if we destroy the natural world, we ultimately destroy human civilization as well. And we see that we're living through that right now for the past 12 months, right? So this concept that there's this um, responsibility, not just to care for nature for nature's sake, but recognizing that caring for nature also means caring for ourselves and vice versa. So that's another really important um, emphasis that the Hindu tradition brings to when it comes to caring for the earth. Thank you, Gopal. So I very much, I see the importance of duty, like one's responsibility as centering uh, the attitude. And I wanna come back and I'll circle back to Rabbi Yonatan and then Elena and back to Huda in reverse order, uh, because in, we know there are conceptualizations of creation that see them as hierarchical and with human beings, you know, as the top of uh, the realm of creation. How does your tradition deal with that idea that can sometimes say, well, since we're at the top, we can exploit and God's abundance and providence is unlimited and he'll just continue to replace and create um, and uh, make things better uh, through ways that we can't imagine right now. So we should trust in God rather than, you know, think that we uh, arrogate to ourselves that we are able to, you know, manage the kind of cosmic order and balance. How do you respond to that? So I come with Rabbi Yonatan. It's a great question, Mahan. There's a, a midrash, a teaching from the Jewish oral tradition of, of the rabbis about 1800 years ago that states that God showed Adam the trees of the Garden of Eden and said to him, see how beautiful and praiseworthy are my works. Everything that I created, I created for you. Be careful not to destroy or despoil my world for if you do, there will be nobody after you to repair it. So this teaching is a, is a deep uh, theological and spiritual principle that we have to take care of creation. We don't have the right to destroy it or despoil it. And for those who say that if we do, that 
God will somehow just wave a wand and, and it'll all be good in our lifetimes. Well, apparently that's, that's not the case. Uh, and so therefore we need to take care of creation. And in regards to your question of how do we relate to nature? So we're, we're part of nature. We are connected and the, you know, the book of Genesis says that God created animals and people on the sixth day of creation. We weren't given our own day. And, and there, in the rabbinic tradition, there are teachings both ways. Um, but one of them says that we're created on the same day as animals to teach that we should be humble. Thank you so much. Elena. Um, uh, I could say also that, um, that we see us as co-creatures. So we have the capacity to take care of our creation and establish a relationship of peace among creatures. So in this way, uh, we are called to be stewards and guardians of all that is made. And I think uh, as, as creatures who bear the image of the one that created life, uh, we are made to care for, protect and respect all that is made. So we have an irrevocable um, responsibility to the creator and to every creature uh, to be God's creating. You know? So restoring and sustaining her own air. Um, and I think uh, we really need to, to live in good relation with, with nature, you know? uh, uh, taking care of this, of this balance and not to abuse of, of, of what the earth offered to us. Thank you. Huda. Yeah, I mean, I can go different ways thinking about this, but I'm thinking of, uh, there are many stories uh, in the Quran and there's also in the Hadith, when the Prophet told us, and then also in the Quran, to be like a tree and to be like a bee. And it's just like how you can think about the tree and the giving of a tree and, and an all manifestation of, of air and, and water and, and, and shelter and uh, just the giving, the giving of it and the community. And also the bees, just learning about the bees, like how they are really uh, sharing uh, any resource they have, they share, they inform all the, the collective, their work in collect uh, collective work and community. So that is emphasized. And, and then in the Quran, it says, you are, you are a community, they are communities like you, like all the animals and they are communities like you. So we are all like uh, uh, creatures of, uh, of the mighty God. And uh, so that kind of uh, tells us, and also the, uh, back again to the issue of uh, balance of, so the, the, in the Quran tells us, uh, these are the signs of God, we rehearse them to thee in truth and God means no injustice to any of God's creatures. Um, so that gives us an emphasis that, um, that we are all um, created for a purpose and, but it's our responsibility as human beings to really, because we are being accountable to all our actions. We're being accountable for the, anything we do to the air or to the water, to our neighbors, to the trees, to the animals, we are accountable for that. And so we need to be, realize that in our actions. Thank you very much to all of you. I'm going to turn to uh, the economy and consumption, capitalism, all of these ideas. So here in the United States, President Biden has announced sweeping policy changes on the climate, including canceling the Keystone Pipeline, rejoining the Paris Agreement, and pausing new permits for drilling on federal land. At the same time, his administration promises new and better jobs to remake a green economy. My question to you is the following. Are the new jobs really green or do they just shift the problem to new sectors like the mining industry for minerals that are needed for this clean energy? And 
try to you know answer this kind of real world policy question uh, with a connection to uh, uh, your faith based perspective if you can. Let's start again now in the middle, maybe we'll begin with Elena. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to say that this is a very interesting question. So first I would like to say that uh, we welcome that the United States be joining the, the Paris Agreement. This reaffirmed the urgency of climate action. And I hope this will be the way uh, towards real ambitious action. So as United States is an important actor um, as part of the developed countries that uh, bear the greatest responsibility for climate crisis, we also call to review the, the indices you know, to make it consistent with the necessary ambitious action. And I really believe that we have now a unique opportunity to, to shift. We are seeing this change in the position of the of, of the government in the United States, but at the same time, we are facing the economic effects of the pandemics, no? and governments are announcing measures of stimulating the economy in the medium and long term. So we have the opportunity now to reimagine the economy, no? take the necessary actions to decarbonize our, our future, so I, I think it's, it's the moment you know, to go into a transformation and change at the individual level, at lifestyles, collective level of organizational choices, and also at a political level you know, of, of law and the structures. So I think there is no other way to achieve the, the, the goals of the Paris Agreement, staying below two degrees, um, pursuing efforts, to be uh, under uh, 1.5 degrees, you know. Um, I, I just said uh, in, in the question, you are right, we don't want to transfer uh, the problem from one side to, to another, right? But uh, I think uh, uh, we've never been so close to, have, to having this, this chance to reset the, the economy on, um, on a more climate-friendly path investing in the transformation to a sustainable, resilience, uh, zero carbon society and economy. So we need now to accelerate the transformation away from fossil fuels. Um, I think when we talk about green, green jobs, uh, I think it is, I would like to add uh, something to, to, to that, you know? So, um, these, these uh, new jobs should be decent jobs too, no? providing respect for workers' fundamental rights at work, health and safety protections, as well as meaning of, of to life with dignity, because we don't want to, to have another <laughs> problem when we are looking for a solution. No? So uh, I, I, yeah, I think I, I, think, uh, I, I would be, I will leave it here. <laughs> Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Elena. Um, I appreciate that. And I'm going to, you know, uh, maybe sharpen the question a little bit and turn to you, Gopal, and then invite uh, Rabbi Yonatan and Huda to comment as well. And then I have a couple more questions, and then we're going to go to uh, some questions that came in to us um, uh, that were pre-submitted. And I invite uh, people who are attending and joining us online to think about possible questions that they can ask that we'd like to turn to in the end. So Gopal, uh, here's what I'm thinking. We say zero emission cars, right? I, I feel happy about going, you know, carbon free, but there's, you know, materials extraction and then manufacture and then, you know, uh, transport across the world. And if we take all of that into account, it's not quite zero, right? There's a footprint. And so is the problem really not consumption, overconsumption? And if we think of it that way, that we have to begin to actually extract, you know, and exploit the earth less to come back to balance and justice, um, then is that not really challenging the economic system the, uh, that prevails? And it's inviting us to reimagine, you know, human... Uh, uh, lifestyles and perhaps new uh, kinds of, you know, a new global order, if you will, or new economic order. 
And religion is all about, you know, being satisfied with less, not going for more. So given that, do you think there's a tension here? How do you, how do you deal with this question? Well, thank you for throwing that one at me first. I <laughs> appreciate that. Um, well, to the first part of your question, from a, from a Hindu perspective, one thing I would share is that um, Hinduism teaches that there is always suffering in the world. And one can never live a life where we're not causing harm or suffering either to ourselves, to other people or to the planet, right? And if you look at certain Dharmic traditions such as the Jain tradition, they have a very strict code of, of, of conduct, ethical life where the, the Jain monks will, will sweep the floor before they walk or will wear a mask over their face so they, so they, so they don't breathe in certain microbes and, and so on like that, right? So a, so a Hindu, a more broader Dharmic worldview has that understanding that nothing is zero emission, nothing is zero harm, right? Just by driving any car or by taking any walk, we are causing harm and impacting the world and the environment around us, right? So the key from the Hindu perspective is what minimizes that harm? What minimizes that emission? Because no system, no human made system or structure is perfect. There's always gonna be some fault. So how do we minimize the, the negative impact that we're doing? And in the course of minimizing, how do we move people's hearts, minds, and consciousness in a direction where people understand greater con connectivity with each other and the greater responsibility that they have to each other and to the world around them, right? So that's the, that's the first part of your question in terms of the zero emission piece. The capitalism piece is, I think is really interesting because I do think we're at an inflection point right now, as Elena was saying, that we are having to rethink global economics, um, financial institutions and structures, because we're seeing that our current economic models do not work for all people, right? They work for a very small subset of people um, and for the majority, it doesn't work for them. And certain economic markers are no longer valid or increasingly becoming outdated. Even the Secretary General of the United Nations a couple of months ago in a speech he gave on climate change said that we need to reconsider GDP because he said GDP is no longer an acceptable marker of success and progress. Because a country can be having strong GDP, but still be ruining its environment, right? And we would consider under our current model that that country is a success because the GDP is growing. But we don't take into consideration if they're polluting their rivers or cutting down their forests and so on like that. And so we do need to move away from a, a GDP, an unlimited growth-based economic model. And the topic of overconsumption from a spiritual, and this will be my final point on this, from a spiritual perspective, is really overconsumption is a spiritual issue at heart. You know, Mahatma Gandhi said, there is enough in the world for every single person's need, but not for a single person's greed. And by that, what he meant is that there's enough for everyone, but the human being has unlimited desires, unlimited need to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And that desire is only tempered when there's a strong inner life, a strong inner joy and contentment with the world around us. And so I think that's the root cause of this. It, the economic structures and the models and the buying of too many things is a symptom of a lack of spiritual life within the people of the world. And I think that's the role that the faith communities really need to bring out strongly is how to cultivate that inner life so that outer life isn't as harmful as it is today. Oh, that's lovely. Um, we, have ev we have enough for everyone's need, but not everyone's greed. I think of, you know, being here in the United States, I'm uh, in enjoying the abundance that we have here, but um, we would need five Earth planet Earths for everyone to live uh, at this lifestyle. And so something has to change. Rabbi Yonatan, what do you think about this, th this thread of questions? I'm, I'm in total agreement with with you, Mahan, and, and with you, Gopal, about that uh, the ecological crisis is not really a crisis of the birds and the bees and the trees and the toads. It's a crisis of the human being and how we live as spiritual beings in a physical reality. And in relation to what you're asking, Mahan, about, well, you know, you know, General Motors just said that uh, they're going to switch to all electrics in the coming years. And, uh, and doesn't that then solve our problems that everyone will just switch to an electric car and then we're, we're in the good? Well, as we know, you know, electric cars have less emissions than uh, gasoline powered cars with industrial 
with internal combustion engines, but gas electric cars um, also have batteries. And as you said, batteries require uh, uh, different chemicals to enable the battery to work. And so uh, there's a, a ecologist by the name of David Ehrenfeld who wrote a book, um, The Arrogance of Humanity, in which he talks about quasi solutions. And you know that essentially there, electric cars are going to help the problem of climate change, but we will end up with a battery disposal issue, similar to how there's a nuclear waste disposal issue that uh, that the U.S. still hasn't figured out how to deal with. And so, therefore, we need to address the issue at its roots. Henry David Thoreau said, "For every hundred people hacking at the branches of the tree of evil, one person's hacking at the roots." And as Gopal said, the roots of this are about uh, consumption, which is really about where do we find our pleasure, pleasure satisfaction. And, and so therefore that's the role of religion to moderate consumption, help us to think long-term, help us to be net givers and altruists instead of takers. And I think that that's why we need to really mobilize religion in order to find a sustainable solution. Thanks Rabbi Yonatan. Um, Huda, uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so as an educator I, with my students and the community, I, I, this is a general, like there must be a practice we do, is okay, make a list of the things that you need and then a list of the things that you want. And let's, let's do that practice. And, and just focusing on the things that you need um, and, then, and then building on that, that this is what ecological balance is. And that's the balance. That's the balance also in, in, in the Quran. It's that fulfill the things that you need. That's, uh, that's there is, as, I, as it was mentioned, there's abundance to meet everyone's needs. And so this practice, this just exercise that we do, it just resonates with everyone. And it says, yeah, just focus on the, on the issues that you need. And, uh, and you can see what, where there is abundance that can um, meet everyone's uh, needs. And then we can all share together and build this community. And then, uh, I mean, we, we need now, I mean, really to focus on just transition, uh, which stopping the bad while building the new. Uh, we must change the rules uh, to redistribute resources and power to local communities. Uh, just transition initiatives are shifting from dirty energy to energy democracy. Uh, from funding highways to expanding public transit, from incinerators and landfills to zero waste, from industrial food systems to food sovereignty, from gentrification to community land rights, from military violence to peaceful resolution, and from rampant destructive development to ecosystem restoration and soul healing. Um, core to just transition is deep democracy, in which workers and communities have control over the decisions that affect their daily lives. So it's time for the collective, the time for uh, democracy in all aspects, energy, water, democracy, and uh, community. Thank you, Huda. Uh, I have a comment here from one of the uh, attendees in the audience who says, um, uh, more of a comment in sync with Gopal, you spoke on this first and I think everybody kind of resonated with it, that our uh, life on earth is, you know, penultimate, partial, it's always partial. So there's no possibility of zero damaging effects, uh, only minimizing uh, harm. And uh, perhaps that's one way to think about, you know, uh, moving towards greener technologies. So thank you for that comment. And looking at this resonance, um, my next question is, and we'll begin with you, Rabbi Yonatan. Uh, how do we build dialogue uh, across faiths around environmental issues? Uh, what are the biggest challenges um, to generating broad-based, you know, multi-faith coalitions around the environment? Have you encountered such challenges? Uh, who's missing from the conversation? How can we in improve the conversation? So over to you. Great questions. Well, multi-faith coalitions on sustainability do exist. And, and this webinar is an example of such of that happening. 
And it's, it's also amazing that when we come together, we actually see how much we have in common. The, the panelists on this call, uh, we're deeply in agreement, even though we, we have different religious practices. Um, and, you know, over the centuries and millennia, uh, faith adherents in our religions have, have fought each other tooth and nail. Um, but actually, we all realize that we're on the same ship. And this is a collective ship. It's sort of like Noah's Ark. And unless we put aside our differences, uh, then we're going to suffer the same collective fate. And, and so that's the real challenge here. Uh, and, you know, I, I find that within, and in some ways, as I was saying earlier, the ecological crisis is a crisis of religion. Because in my experience, most religions are not prioritizing ecological sustainability at the current moment. And, and why is that? I think it, it partially has to do with, uh, there's so much in religion over the millennia old teachings and, and the ecological crisis is a relatively new crisis, even though it has deep roots. Uh, and so therefore, I think that we need to come together and, and say, look, we're gonna stop trying to convert each other to, our, each, to our, our own religion. I accept that you're a Muslim. I accept that you're a Hindu. I accept that you're a Christian. And now let's find a way to, to find common cause so that the next generation can inherit a livable planet. Thank you so much, Rabbi Yonatan. I think that's beautifully put. Uh, I'm just going to ask if anyone else would like to chime in on this question uh, before I move to the next one. Yes, this is Huda here. So yeah, so people of faith, Muslims included, have a great responsibility to stand up for environmental and climate justice uh, and address the concerns and calamities of the poor and marginalized communities. So when we think of the poor and if we hear the cry of the poor and, and, and stand by that, that that's really brings us together definitely on, uh, on these issues. And then we also, I mean, we have in, in Wisconsin, we, we have currently, Wisconsin Green Muslims has two interfaith healing initiatives. One is Wisconsin Faith in Solar, and one is, and the other one is Faithful Rainwater Harvesting, or Farah, which means joy. These initiatives really connect communities uh, of 18 different faith traditions and spiritualities. So when we talk about water, we talk about light. This is all like the commons and it's really um, sacred gifts and sacred trust which resonates with, uh, with all those faith communities. So yes, we can, we can definitely work together. Thank you. Um, yes, Elena. Uh, so I, I also, I think it, it is, well, as Lutheran World Federation, we, we are involved in, in, in some coalitions uh, and some networks, the Interfaith Liaison Committee to the UNFCCC or the Geneva Interfaith Forum here where we are based. But, but, I, but, but I think that the most important uh, is converting this dialogue into action. As, as my colleagues uh, said, no? So, uh, and I think faith leaders and faith communities have the tremendous power to influence, uh, have the potential to make a difference at the, at the individual level of lifestyles, but also have the potential to lobby local policy makers, no? to, to, to take urgent action, to improve and protect our, our environment. So I, I think, um, uh, I think this is this is uh, it is beyond generating broad based multi faith uh, coalition, but uh, I, I must say also that um, that uh, as a faith based organization um, and um, to tackle the climate impacts, we need a, a multi stakeholder approach. And faith leaders are conveners and good facilitators to promote dialogue bringing different perspective to the, to the process, including communities that do not often uh, engage in this kind of dialogue in order to ensure just inclusive and sustainable solutions. Yeah, I, I, over to you. Thank you. Coco, would you like to add something? 
Yeah, I know you have other questions you want to get to, but if I can just yes, please get go ahead. Get in on this one quickly. Um, echoing what a, what a lot of has been said already, I think the coalitions exist globally, and definitely exist at a grassroots level in pockets. And I think the challenge is is to connect the, the grassroots with the global faith based coalitions on on climate and biodiversity is really important. I think some of the challenges around this, especially in the Western world, is the, the changing demographics of religious identification and affiliation amongst young people. I think that's a major issue that faith-based institutions haven't really grappled with at the moment. And so I think if we're looking at mobilizing the faiths, faith landscape is changing quite significantly in the Western world um, and increasing in other parts. Um, and then a couple of things around language, You know, we spoke about that earlier. I think also the way we talk about this, I think I would love to see these conversations not just be in siloed with the faith-based world, but also into the world of business, arts, policy and government and so on. I think the time has come where the faith need to kind of step out and stop talking to ourselves because we've done that for a long time and actually start talking to other people in other sectors. And that language has to change. You know, If we approach it with the language of religion and spirituality, we may find a, a closed door, but if we lead with values and beliefs and ethics, we'll find common cause with a number of different sectors who traditionally may not want to work with faith-based actors. And then the final point I'd want to raise is that also as we build these faith-based coalitions is recognizing, as Jonathan is saying, that there is commonality, but there's also difference and various focus points for the different traditions as well. I know, I, I mean, one example I raise is that um, with Pope Francis's Laudato C, he really changed the narrative in, in significant ways and, you know, and his strapline is care for the poor, care for the planet. Um, and that's in many ways has been adopted by the faith-based movement, but that's a very, we would say that's a very Christian lens to approach the, to caring for the earth, that the poor should be the focus. Uh, a Hindu would say the focus should be the animals. You know, let's start with the most vulnerable in society, which are the animals and the oceans and the trees. And so I think that also needs to be interrogated a little bit, which is that when we have these multi-faith coalitions, who is um, framing the narrative? And oftentimes it's, um, more older, larger institutional traditions, and oftentimes the minority indigenous traditions are having to pay more, do more work to get ensure that their worldviews and their narratives are reflected in the broader um, faith-based coalitions as well. So I think those are some interesting um, challenges I think we're gonna have to confront if we really want to make this movement stronger and larger than it currently is. Thank you. Well, we have a lot of interesting questions coming in, and I see that time is running short. So I'm going to go through uh, some of them. I won't be able to get to all of them, but I hope we can get uh, as many as we can. And you don't all have to answer all of them. I'm going to invite anyone who wishes to speak to any of these uh, to just jump in. So speaking of interfaith coalitions and who's missing, one of the questions we had was, um, do we engage with indig indigenous peoples? Does any of your work um, intersect with that community? And then uh, similarly, what about the Baha'i faith? Does anyone want to take that? Um, I can do that quickly. Again, I mentioned we, we have those uh, initiatives that working with the, on sunlight and water, and that's really bringing in the indigenous community. Uh, when we talk about water healing, and the sacredness of water. Uh, we pray uh, together in the rivers and we, we, we share our traditions and uh, appreciation of water as a healer. And, uh, and with the Baha'is, yes, they are part of the uh, 18 different the faith traditions. We talk about light, uh, sunlight, and the power of the unifying power of solar energy and, uh, and just, uh, yeah, and others as well. How nice. Okay, um, let me jump to another topic. There's a question on uh, online about um, dialogue between different stakeholders and nations. So on the one hand, we talk about dialogue across religions, but I noticed many of you, you know, you work in multiple continents, uh, Latin America, in the case of Elena, lots of experience there. Uh, Jonathan, you mentioned LA and even work in Africa. Uh, uh, Gopal, you mentioned um, India. And so the question that's coming is, 
um, how, how, does this, how does your work translate across the different worldviews that you might encounter? But a related question is on the different uh, ways in which these different um, uh, uh, nations even are situated in the planet. And so some have been, they're on the periphery of the global capitalist system. And historically they've been exploited for resources. And now we have, you know, the center of uh, uh, that exploitation is somehow sounding alarm bells and saying everyone has to, you know, be more careful. So how do you bring everyone on board and do you encounter these kinds of tensions? And they, there was one comment specifically in reference to the Democratic Republic of Congo. So who would like to take some aspect of this question? I want to take some aspect of this yes. question. As, as we, uh, as, as a Lutheran World Federation, we facilitate, as, uh, in Central America, for example, we facilitate dialogue. Uh, and I think faith leader uh, and faith community, faith, faith organization has uh, this potential no, to, to call different actors to sit around the, the table and to discuss about climate, uh, climate issues, for example. No? And I think, uh, and I think uh, this approach between uh, faith leaders, scientists, private sector, so uh, we really need to, to start talking within uh, each other because uh, there's no other way to tackle the, the climate impacts. No? Uh, and of course, there are different um, point of view, no? But uh, this is, uh, this is the, the, the objective, to sit around, no? To talk about and to look, look for, for solutions, no? So, uh, and now uh, at a global level also, there is one initiative where faith leaders are uh, talking with, with scientists, you know? It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a global initiative. Uh, um, um, we we are having a lot of different uh, meetings during these months before COP, uh, and the idea is again to reinforce that we really need to to uh, raise awareness about climate issues, and um, we we should not forget that uh, we need to advocate to, to our governments, you know, to increase their their commitments to tackle this, this problem. Thank you. Yeah, Gopal, you wanted to add something? Yeah, if I can come in. So like one issue, one campaign I've been working with with an NGO is to um, advocate for plant-based diets. We know that meat reduction is one of the key things any individual can do to reduce their carbon emissions. Um, and we've been struggling to find the right messaging for the US and for India because in the US meat consumption is very high. Um, and so, you know, there's a real need to lower that, that level of consumption. In India, meat consumption is very, very low um, in, in relation to the population and in, uh, how much an individual consumes. And in India, you have the added challenge where the cow is considered very sacred, right? And so to ask Hindus to not consume milk products, which are from an animal, which, is, which they consider very sacred for thousands of years is challenging. And so I think, part of our work is to find the nuance. You know, this is, this is almost, we talk about environmental peace building. This is environmental advocacy that is nonviolent. Because if I go to India and ask them to give up milk, for a lot of Hindus, that's a violent proposition because you're asking them to go against one of the central tenets of their faiths, which is to not worship the cow anymore and not to take the milk products it produces. And so this is part of the challenge that, the, that we can bring as the faiths because we are, as you're saying, you know, we span the world. We've been around longer than most of the current nation states and we'll be around after the nation states disappear as well. And so we can bring a global perspective that a single nation state can't. And I think, again, speaking to my previous answer, that's something I think we need to be bringing more to the table, more to policy makers, is that we can speak to the concerns of the world with one voice more than a single country can. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Gopal. Yeah, Rabbi Yonatan, you want to add something? Just to relate to my holy brother Gopal, I, I mean, there's a similar work that uh, I'm involved in within the Jewish community around a plant-based diet. Uh, I'm part of a, a group of a couple hundred rabbis that have signed onto a letter supporting a plant-based diet, and and yet it conflicts with, um, you know, their their famous Jewish foods like uh, bagels and cream cheese, or uh, or deli meat. Um, and so how could it be 
it, it, wouldn't it be sacrilegious not to eat meat to, to not eat meat on the Sabbath? Um, but at the same time, uh, the the first chapter of Genesis, uh, verse twenty nine, says that God told people to eat plants, and the next verse says God told animals to eat plants, and it was so. And the next verse says that God saw that it was very good. What was very good was that life did not take life to sustain life. The lion lay down with the lamb. And even though that vision was lost after the flood of Noah, but according to, to some rabbis like uh, Rabbi Abraham Cook, the first chief rabbi of pre-state Israel, that, that vision is something we're going to return to. And, and he wrote that in 1903. And a lot of rabbis believe the time has come. And so, you know, in, in some ways, the ecological crisis, as I said earlier, it's really a reckoning for religion. What's more important, a, a sustainable planet or that we continue certain religious rituals, which may not actually be the core of the religion? Is it really, the, is, it, is it a deeply religious act to eat a deli sandwich? Is, is that, the, is that the, the climax of religion? Certainly not. And therefore, ecological understandings of religion can actually renew religion. And a lot of young people, therefore, find it more meaningful to have an ecological understanding of, of their religion. Thank you. That's, I'm going to bring it where about four minutes out. I have two questions, and I'm going to combine them with great skill uh, and ask all of you to then make your final comments. Um, uh, to any aspect of those uh, combined questions. And we'll go in the same order as we began with. So one question is, look, we all, we all can kind of agree. Maybe we even have a sympathetic audience uh, in the crowd. Uh, but there are a lot of um, people who quote the same verses from the same scripture or have, you know, draw on the same kind of uh, tradition. But for the sake of exploitation and human domination, right? So how do we have a conversation with them? Do we need to convince them or do we need to marginalize them? So that's the first question. And then the final question is, and it's related in this way, how do you consider your work as an aspect of a peace building? through faith-based environmental activism. So we will begin with Huda and then go to Elena, Rabbi Yonatan, and conclude with Gopal. Yeah, so I would, I would not marginalize them, nor, uh, what's the other word you used? So I said marginalize, or do we convince them? Oh, convince them, yeah. Well, uh, convincing is something beyond uh, my control. Uh, it says that the prophet said uh, he, he's a messenger. So he just, uh, and, and that, uh, God is the one who opens the hearts and, and minds, but we are, we are messengers and we do the best we can. But what, will I, what I will do is I will neutralize them. So I will kind of uh, try to reach that level where they are not an, an enemy, but at least they are, uh, neutralized uh, in their position, if, if possible. Um, and there's that's lots a, of- That's a better word than marginalized. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely I'm not. Yeah, neutralize them. That's also when we do our uh, power mapping and, and, and all this strategizing, that's what, that's what we do is like how we can neutralize that uh, section or whatever we're talking about. Uh, if we cannot win them over. Uh, but at least we move the needle, which is that's the, that's that's the that's what we measure as success is that we move the needle from one position to the other, from an enemy to or whatever opposing to neutral neutral positions, um, and then hopefully moving over to supporter, um, and then uh, again I, I just want to mention again that we uh, strategizing uh, we we thought about healing as a way for, for our work moving uh, forward. Um, and that just came from many, many uh, discussions with the community. And we found that it's time for to focus on healing practices and how we can, how we can do that uh, together. And, but it's rooted in, in re realizing the wounds. So, so we have to respect that there is wounds 
and we are we are really moving uh, collectively uh, towards healing. So we call ourselves wounded healers uh, because we learn from other healers of the world and be ourselves effective healers of the world. That's how how we are asking ourselves how we can be be that at this time. Uh, but it's time to light the way. Uh, the intensity of light is stronger in darkness, providing greater opportunity to, for light to lead the way. Uh, let's continue to work together, countering darkness, spreading light, and healing justice. So I'll leave it at that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Huda. Elena. Thank you, Maha. Uh, well, uh, for the first question, I think uh, we... Uh, we should include them into the dialogue, you know? So that, that's my, my first thought. But I would like to, to emphasize in the second one that you, you, you ask us about our work and uh, in relation with uh, peace building, right? Yes. So um, and I, I am thinking now in, in, in my experience working in, in Central America, you no, know, uh, and how climate change exacerbating conflicts no so you know that uh, honduras el salvador they are suffering violence they are suffering suffering conflict for many many years uh, uh, and last year uh, they suffer uh, two two trop uh, tropical storm and two hurricanes in the same month so people are really facing uh, new, new, new challenges. So um, they, these extreme weather events are exacerbating uh, the, the, the situation there, uh, especially uh, the people that depend on agriculture for their livelihood. So I really think that um, um, to, to do climate uh, ju uh, justice action is a way also to look for peace in, in, in this kind of, of, of countries or in this kind of, of situation. No? So, um, because climate change uh, uh, have so many, many drivers to exacerbate conflicts. So um, I think, Peace building actors uh, should uh, proactively identify climate action as an opportunity to build sustainable sustainable peace. You know? um, I, I, I also could say that um, approaches that link climate action and development can, can help to bring short-term adaptation and long-term resilience. I am talking about that because um, my work is to is more related to, to work with the communities and implement projects and doing advocacy at a national and regional level, accompany the, the churches. So I really think that um, uh, climate change is, is, is a driven for, for more conflicts in, in the coming the coming year. So um, we also need to, to, to take uh, into account this angle in, uh, in our work. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan. So I'll briefly say two things. One is that I don't think it's about marginalizing or even neutralizing. I think it's about educating. Most clergy in the world today have never heard a 15 minute talk on environmental science. And that's because most seminaries simply don't teach environmental science. And most clergy in the world don't talk about religion and ecology. So therefore, we need to educate them. Um, the second, educate on the connection between religion and ecology. The second thing I'll say is about environmental peace building. Nature knows no boundaries. Here in Jerusalem, we find that one of the few things that can bring people together is ecological sustainability. And we're proud that we've held seven conferences here with Muslims, Christians, and Jews, including religious leaders. And so that's really the path forward. Either we're going to unite as, 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 as all of God's creatures um, or, or something else will happen. But my hope is that we will, my hope and my blessing is that we will unite and, and be able to find common cause for a sustainable planet. Thank you, Rabbi Yonatan. And you know, I just saw a question. I'm not going to ask it. 
I'm only mentioning it because you seem to have at least partially answered it with your comment on education. There was someone who's concerned with the rise of authoritarianism and misinformation, et cetera. And so uh, we have to do our best to educate. Gopal, you have the final word. No, no pressure then. Um, I, I, I would say that um, what needs to happen um, is that we need to build a large tent. Um, everyone needs to come on this journey. You know, we're only going to succeed if we can bring everyone with us. And to, in order to do that requires a lot of work. It requires listening, it requires empathy, compassion and dialogue. And until we can get there, you know, we're going to struggle because up until now, the environmental movement and to as a subset, the faith based environmental movement has oftentimes adopted a singular narrative and a singular approach that this is what everyone needs to do. This is the solution and everyone needs to come along with us. And if you don't, then we're not going to work with you. And I think that is not a faith based approach to this work. A faith based approach is understanding everyone is different. Our needs, interests and concerns are different. And we need to reach out to everyone in order to bring them on the journey. And if we can do that, we can we can solve this. But until we can get to that place, we're going to struggle. And so that would be my my final offering. Thank you so much to Huda from Wisconsin, Elena from Geneva, Rabbi Jonathan from Jerusalem, and Gopal from New Jersey. It was a real honor to be with you. We went a little bit over time, but I hope everyone thinks it was worth it. And I'd like to invite Elsa back for some concluding remarks and to tell us what's next. Yeah, thank you so much for such an exciting conversation. And thank you to all who are joining us from the audience. Um, a big thanks again to our moderator, Dr. Mahan Mirza and each of our panelists. Um, we hope that you all and, and the audience will join us for the next two sessions in our series. Um, next Thursday, February 18th, at the same time and same place, we will be discussing decolonizing the land, Christian grassroots movements, and environmental peace building. Um, and then the following Thursday, February 25th, we will have an interactive breakout discussion on how to translate our conversation into action through practicing what we preach, dialogue and futurism in environmental peace building. And hopefully this can act as sort of a first step in the direction that many of you all have suggested as the need for dialogue and the need for action. So please note that this, this third event requires a separate registration process as it will be taking place in a more interactive Zoom format. So please be on the lookout for a link to register along with the recording of this meeting. So see you all then and thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>